This is a talk in the hyperbolic geometry and manifold session of the NCNGT conference. Today I'll talk about stable complex length in graphs of groups. So let me start by telling you what stable complex length, uh, stable commutator length is. Roughly speaking, um, it is a minimal complexity of surfaces bounding a given loop in the space. Uh, formally, the given data is a topological space X and a non-homologous loop gamma. Being non-homologous means that gamma bounds some singular surface, and these are exactly the surfaces that we take into consideration. Such surfaces are called admissible surfaces, um, and an admissible surface um, consists of two pieces of data. One is the underlying topological surface, um, compact oriented. The other is a map from the surface to the given space X, such that each boundary component of the surface wraps around the given loop gamma, possibly several times. From the map F, we can read off these integers, indicating how many times each boundary component wraps around the given loop gamma. And the sum of these numbers is called the degree of the, of the admissible surface. Then the stable complex length is defined to be the uh, minimal complexity of these admissible surfaces. And for each admissible surface, its complexity is this negative uh, chi minus divided by two times the degree. And here chi minus is almost the order characteristic of the surface, but we need to remove disk and sphere components before taking the order characteristic. In the more natural language, this is propo uh, proportional to the Gromov volume of the surface. Or in other words, it, it is proportional to the minimal number of triangles one needs to tile the entire surface. Um, so in this sense, this complexity is uh, a natural notion for surfaces. And also, um, this complexity has a nice property that both the numerator and denominator are multiplicative uh, in the sense that uh, when we start with an admissible surface, we can take a finite cover, composing the covering map and the given map F, we get a new admissible surface. Then the new surface that we get, um, both the numerator and denominator are multiplied by the covering degree. So the complexity um, stays invariant. And then one can show that um, it actually, the stable complex actually only depends on the fundamental group G of the space X and the group element G uh, representing the um, loop gamma. And here's a concrete example when gamma is a commutator of two elements X and Y. In this case, we can realize the once punctured torus as an admissible surface. Um, and the, and the map uh, takes the two standard uh, generators of the once punctured torus to X and Y. Uh, with the correct orientation, then the boundary will wrap around gamma exactly once. So uh, this makes the once punctured torus uh, into an admissible surface of degree one. So then plugging into the definition, the complexity is one half. So taking the infimum we see that the stable comb length of a commutator is always at most a half. So we see it is very easy to get an upper bound um, by just exhibiting one admissible surface. On the other hand, proving a nice lower bound or even computing the stable comb length is usually a, a challenge. And the reason is that the space of surfaces has very little structure and it is very hard to take the infimum in general. And um, one of our focus today is to talk about how uh, one can compute the stable complement. And one reason that the stable complement is interesting is that it is related to understanding surfaces in spaces. The stable complement also has very nice properties that uh, that's another reason that uh, people are interested in it. We have mentioned that it only depends on the fundamental group, and actually there is an outbreak definition um, using commutators. So that's why it is called the uh, stable commutator length. 
It also has a nice property that it is non-increasing under any group homomorphism because uh, this is because um, the homomorphism induces a map for the corresponding spaces and that map can push forward admissible surfaces. So the target can only have better surfaces. So stable, stable common length can never go up. In particular, if the map is an isomorphism, then we have equality. So one can think of stable common length as some kind of invariant function on groups. Another important property is that it is due to the so-called quasimorphisms, which are closely related to the second bounded cohomology of the group. This is called the Brevard duality. It is a very powerful tool, but we will not go into the details because we are uh, not going to use it today. Um, but I'll mention two important corollaries. One is that it tells us certain groups has stable common length always zero. Um, this is true, for example, when the group is amenable or higher rank irreducible lattice, like um, SLNZ for n greater than or equal to three. Uh, this will show up later as a condition in the um, main theorem. On the other hand, many groups um, have um, have uh, highly non-trivial stable counter length. Um, here by uh, highly non-trivial, I mean that um, most elements have stable common length greater than or equal to some positive constant, um, and all the others have stable common length zero and can be classified in a quite explicit way. Um, combining the last two facts uh, and the monotonicity of stable common length under homomorphisms, one can often prove that um, there are very few homomorphisms from groups with vanishing stable common length to groups with highly non-trivial stable common length. And this can be used to prove certain rigidity results. The stable common length is also closely related to the gromov thurston norm. Here's the setup. Let A be a subspace in the space X. A is possibly empty. Let alpha be a second relative homology class. Then such a homology class is represented by certain singular surfaces in the space X with boundary lying inside the subspace A. Then the Gromov norm of the homology class alpha is defined in a way similar to the stable complex by taking the infimum um, complexity of these surfaces representing a multiple of the a homology class alpha. Um, this is equivalent to the definition using triangles. Um, namely, there's a, a equivalent definition which counts the minimal number of triangles in any cycle representing the uh, homology class alpha. Uh, they are equivalent because basically this uh, numerator here um, is the minimal number of triangles one needs to tile the surface. Uh, in a special case, when we have the three manifold with, um, with boundary, uh, there's a similar notion called the Thurston norm, which kind of defined in the same way, except that n is uh, always taken to be one and the surface is taken to be embedded. Ignoring those two differences, um, this will be exactly a half of the Gromov norm. But in fact, this holds true in general. Um, and the reason is that Thurston showed that um, this norm using embedded surfaces is linear on rays. Um, so that, um, having this n or not doesn't really make a difference. Um, and also by a deep theorem of Gabay and Thurston on top foliations, one can also ignore the embeddedness. Uh, one nice thing about the uh, Thurston norm is that it's always an integer by definition because it's an infimum uh, of a bunch of integers. Um, as a concrete example, we can take um, a notch in the three sphere and let the knot complement be our space X um, and the subspace A is the boundary torus. 
each node spawns uh, some separate surfaces, um, which are embedded surfaces in the node complement whose boundary is exactly the knot. Um, then we can think of the knot as, uh, uh, as an embedded loop on the boundary torus. In this case, each cipher surface represents a homology class alpha, and such a homology class is actually uh, unique with the property that its, um, uh, its boundary is a homology class alpha as a homology class in, uh, in the space A. So here's a, a long exact sequence explains what's happening. Um, gamma represents a loop, so it's a first homology class in the space A. Um, it is trivial in X because it bounds a surface in X. So it must come from some homology class, um, uh, some, uh, come from some uh, reactive homology class. Um, that class must be trivial, uh, but must be unique because the second homology class of the whole space is trivial for the not complement. In this case, the stable complement uh, is proportional to the Gromov norm and the Thurston norm uh, because Admissible surfaces in the definition of SCL in this situation uh, correspond to those surfaces representing a multiple of the homology class alpha. So in this case, we see that the stable com length is always a half integer, uh, and one can also compute it as uh, the, knot, uh, the genus of the knot minus a half. Here, the genus of the knot is the minimal genus of separate surfaces, which is a knot not invariant and can be used to detect or not. So the upshot in this example is that, uh, firstly, the stable complex is rational. Secondly, um, the, um, the stable complex is achieved by uh, any uh, separate surface of minimal genus. Um, these surfaces are called extremal and they have nice properties. So let's take a closer look. So recall the definition of, of the stable complex is this uh, infimum of those uh, complexity of uh, admissible surfaces. We say a surface is extremal if it realizes infimum. We mentioned earlier that um, this complexity doesn't change if we pass to a finite cover so, um, so extremal surfaces, um, their finite cover are also extremal surfaces. And whenever an extremal surface exists, the stable complex must be rational. In general, when we take an infimum um, over all these rational numbers, the stable complex could be irrational. And there are actual examples where it is irrational. Extremal surfaces are nice in the sense that they induce, uh, the induced map on the fundamental group is injective. So this gives a way to find uh, free subgroups and in many cases, uh, closed surface subgroups in groups, um, in certain groups. So this uh, relates the problem of understanding stable common length um, to this problem of finding surface subgroups in uh, certain groups. Um, and this, um, let me give a um, brief proof sketch for this proposition. If the map is, non, uh, is not injunctive, then there are some non-trivial uh, elements in the kernel. If we are lucky, such an element can be represented by some in uh, simple closed loop. In this special case, we can compress the surface, namely by cutting the surface open and gluing two copies of disks. Then we, uh, we can extend the map over these two new disks since the loop is now homotopic in the target space. Uh, this gives us a singular surface contradicting with the assumption that the surface we start with is extremal. In general, we may not realize uh, the ele non-trivial element in the kernel to be a simple closed curve, but we can, do, we, can, uh, we can have that by passing to a finite cover. Uh, this is called, uh, this is using the large property of the uh, free group or the surface group. Since extremal surfaces are nice, we would like to understand uh, which groups and for which elements 
such extreme of surfaces exist and when the stable cum lens is rational. The first breakthrough in this direction is made by uh, Dan Calgary to show that for free groups, there is a linear programming algorithm to compute the stable computed length for any given element. And the result of the algorithm produces extremal surfaces. So in particular, the stable cum length is always rational. This is related to the Gromov's question. He asked uh, whether every one-ended word hyperbolic group contains a closed surface group. The motivating um, important example is a case when the group is the fundamental group of a closed hyperbolic manifold. Kalmakovich showed that um, in this case, the answer is positive. And this leads to um, the solution of um, the virtual uh, Hacken conjecture in this um, important building block. But there are many other groups out there. They are hyper hyperbolic, but uh, it's very difficult to find surface subgroups without using the extremal surface technique. And here's an example. Um, given an element in the computer subgroup of a free group, we can form a new group called the double of the, uh, of the, of the free group over that element. Topologically, this can be uh, visualized as follows. We can realize this element as a loop in, a uh, in such a space representing the free group. The inclusion of the loop into the space gives us a mapping cylinder, which is half of the picture. Then we can double the picture and glue, the, um, and glue, the, uh, glue them together along this red circle. The new space has, fundamental group, has a new fundamental group, which is called the double of the free group. It is a one relator group, and it is also an amalgamation over Z of two free groups. In this case, um, an application of the existence of extremal surfaces shows that for such a group, we can always find the surface subgroup. And here's the reason. The element G bounds some extremal surface in the free group. So we can visualize that as some kind of surface, let's say, uh, supported on the left of the picture, and where each boundary uh, component of the surface is support wraps around this red circle. Then we can double the picture um, to get another copy of the surface on the right and glue the two copies along the boundary. This produces a closed uh, surface, um, and that gives a, a surface subgroup in the double. And we can check injectivity using the injectivity of um, the extremal surfaces. Since then, there are several generalizations of this theorem of um, Caligari, I mean the rationality theorem. And our main theorem puts all these generalizations into the same framework. And we also um, provide new interesting examples exhibiting this uh, rationality phenomenon. Here, uh, the group, the, uh, here we consider graphs of groups and under certain Assumptions on the vertex and edge groups uh, will show that there's a linear programming algorithm to compute the stable compute length. And the result is always rational, uh, no matter which element is the input. Here, graphs of groups are generalizations of amalgamations and HN extensions. Uh, it consists of the following data. Um, we, have, um, uh, we have a simple graph. Um, the simplex case um, is when we have an edge with two distinct vertices and one edge with the same vertex. Then um, for each uh, vertex, there's a corresponding vertex group and each edge uh, a corresponding edge group. Each edge is adjacent to two vertices. Um, these two, um, and corresponding to these adjacencies, there are two inclusions of the edge group to the two nearby vertex groups. Out of uh, such data, we can build a new group called the fundamental group of the graph of, uh, graph of groups, or just simply the graph of groups, 
with the associated data. We can visualize this group as a fundamental group of a topological space. And here's how. For each vertex group and each edge group, we realize them as KG1 spaces. The inclusion from the edge group to the vertex groups uh, gives us a map from the, edge, uh, from the edge space to the vertex space. Then from this map, we can build a mapping cylinder from the edge space uh, to the vertex space. And each edge, uh, each edge space appears twice in this, uh, this kind of um, mapping cylinders because each edge has two inclusions. And we, and we glue these two copies of the edge group together. The space that we obtained in the case where the underlying graph is just a single edge with two distinct vertices. Uh, the fundamental group is just an amalgamation. And in general, the, uh, the fundamental group is the graph of groups that we talked about. In the case of, um, in the case of a single uh, edge with one vertex, this is the HN extension. More concretely, in the HN extension case, if the vertex and the edge group are both Z, um, where the inclusions are given by multiplications by M and L, the group that we obtain is called the bomb select Storytel group with uh, parameters M and L. It has a nice presentation with one single relate uh, with one single relation. This shows up frequently in geometric group theory. For example, any group containing this as a subgroup cannot be hyperbolic. Now let's look at the two assumptions in our main theorem. The first assumption assumes each vertex group has trivial stable Compton lamp. And we mentioned earlier that this is true, for example, when the vertex groups are amenable or hierarchic irreducible lattices. Basically, this assumption assumes that there's no contribution from the vertex groups um, to the uh, stable Compton lamp. Or in other, words, in other words, all the contributions comes from the structure of the graph of groups. So this simplifies the situation. The second uh, assumption is that for each vertex, there are possibly several edges adjacent to it. So we have different uh, images of the edge groups inside this vertex group. We assume these subgroups are central and mutually commensurable. Recall that two subgroups of, of a given group are commensurable if their intersection is finite index in both groups. In other words, uh, the two subgroups are almost the same up to finite index. Most previous resu results either has trivial edge group or um, the edge group is essentially finite. Um, so uh, the, mutual, uh, the mutually commensurable condition is um, vacuous. Here we allow the edge group to be infinite. So uh, this assumption gives us some control on the edge groups. Um, so as a special, uh, so one special case is the uh, um, bomb select starter groups because the vertex group is Z, which is uh, abelian and hence am uh, amenable. Um, and any, non any two non-trivial subgroups of Z are uh, commensurable. For certain, sub, uh, for certain words in the bomb stack sorter groups, this is, uh, the result is already known uh, by the work of Clay, Forrester, and Lausma. Uh, these words are called alternating words, and geometrically they can be visualized as follows. We can thicken this vertex space as a cylinder. Um, and then the alternating words are exactly those represented by loops that can be um, realized this, uh, to be disjoint from this central um, vertex uh, circle. So 
Um, so we can visualize this as loop that goes around um, and then come back, wrap around the vertex and come back, never crossing the central uh, circle. Um, our theorem also generalizes a previous theorem of mine, uh, which, uh, which deals with free products of groups with trivial stable complex. In that case, the second um, assumption is vacuous because we are taking free products. The edge groups are trivial. Uh, it also covers the theorem of Seuss, uh, who showed that uh, the same result holds when, uh, when we have an amalgamation of abelian groups over abelian groups. In the second half of the talk, I'll explain some proof ideas of the main theorem. As I mentioned in the very beginning, the key difficulty in computing the stable complement length is that the space of admissible surfaces has very little structure. More structure arises when we introduce operations on these admissible, admissible surfaces. Here we use cut and pasting to obtain the so-called simple normal form. And roughly speaking, that means uh, we build admissible surfaces from some very simple Lego pieces. This gives uh, admissible surfaces more structure. Then minimizing the complexity of these admissible surfaces is to find the best combination of these Lego pieces. And the second step is to use linear programming to formulate this problem. The key difficulty there is that, especially when the edge group is infinite, the possible types of Lego pieces is um, often infinite. So the key is to build a linear programming problem that is finite dimensional. And that's the main uh, technical part of the proof. <laughs> 